Okay, everyone. Hey, thanks for being here. Nice little crowd. It's awesome. So my name is Kevin. I'm with a Social Voice Project Incorporated the media company which specializes in public history, uh, oral history, things like that. Um, so I appreciate this opportunity to come in today and uh, have a conversation with you rather than a lecture. Right? This is a conversation about some audio, audio engineering uh, that I found relevant in my work as a podcaster, and I'm sure uh, as you share your experiences, uh, they'll be relevant as well. Right? So, and I'm going to share today just some of the salient things um, that I've discovered and use every day in my work um, at the front end of podcasting, which is the microphone. Thing, right? So, uh, who in here is producing? Creating podcasts. Okay, so you guys know what it's about, right? Well, somewhat. Somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> so sound matters, right? So, yeah, you know, the title of this thing is, you know, why good sound matters, right? And so, you know, good sound is subjective, right? What is good sound? You guys tell me. Not a lot of background noise. Yeah. Yes, it's not distracting with background noise. You can understand it, right? It's clear, yeah, intelligible. Yeah. Anybody else? No right or wrong answers here. But. Consistency. Consistent. What do you mean by that? Uh, say if the sound is a concert, you want it to sound depending on cost as well. The uh, media is is the voice of the person, or at least represented. It's delicate, right? Is that yes? When I'm testing speakers, and what I generally want to hear is people singing. Is, do, 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 does this sound like a person? <laughs> yeah, not? yeah, that's true. It's related to fidelity, right? Reproducing that voice so it sounds like that person. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, that's where it all began, personally. And I, and I, when I always talk about this subject, I always say, you know, grandma should sound like grandma. That may sound weird, but let me tell you, I'm going to bump us out here at the beginning of this. A little personal story. So my mother passed away in 2012, and she had been ill for about a year. We knew she was gone. You know? So for the year, I kept saying to my mom, hey, mom, sit down. Let me get some of your stories recorded, you know? Uh, she resisted, resisted. So finally, she said, OK. So I had this moment of opportunity. So I put out my deaf microphone, this quiet space. I recorded my mom. And I'll tell you. I closed my eyes, and you know your mom's voice, right? and that's better than any voice in your life, I think. When I close my eyes and I play back that recording, it, that fidelity is so awesome that it's like my mom is right there, standing next to me, all these years later. Right? So, you know, when we record these voices, there's that dimension too, that is like we're doing a service to the world, maybe. We're certainly doing a service to the person with whom we're recording. So I come from the oral history world, so this really matters a lot. You know, my work, we court a lot of uh, elderly people, older veterans, 90-year-old people, their families bring them in. I want grandma and grandpa to sound like grandma and grandpa to those family members, right? And I'm sorry, you veterans? Veterans. Mm -hmm. We should talk. I hope it is. OK. But uh, I, I was along the lines of what you're saying, though. I, I, so I don't mean to cut you off. No, no, but, go right ahead. But like levels. Consistent levels, yeah, audible between, levels, yeah, between two individuals or you know multiple, right? That it's not really loud for one second, really quiet the next, thing. right? A few things are more annoying if you're listening to something. Yeah, you're having to adjust the volume in the middle. Of Absolutely, all this stuff is so important to the mix of what makes sound good. So what what? Uh, I'll, I'm going to come into this next slide in a second, but let me ask you. Uh, why do you think that so many podcasts don't have good sound? And I would say because levels are crazy off, there's a lot of background noise, the hiss, you can't, you know, it's intel unintelligible, uh, it sounds like it's coming through a Dixie cup. Why do you think people <laughs> put that stuff out there? I can tell you, for one, they don't know squat about audio engineering or recording. Yeah. Right? They don't know anything about it, right? 
here's a microphone. I turn this on. In the old history world, it's it's the worst. You put a tape recorder in the middle of a table, and we're having a conversation. It really sounds like this, you know. Uh, so they don't know, right? That's one thing. Other reason? Limitations such as. Settings on it, yeah. Four people around that one microphone it doesn't sound as great as it does to two people talking to them. Right. There are those just hard, fast technical limitations and things that you deal with, like this blower that I'm hearing, right? Yeah. We have no yeah. control over that at all, right? Well, maybe we do. I don't know. But that's the kind of stuff that just interferes and gets in the way of stuff. Your microphone that you have, right? Whether it's you have one, for example, or you have one that's uh, Maybe um, not conducive to, like, it's not bi directional, right? So you can't pick up two sides of the conversation. Right? Something I personally encountered, like if, if it's over a phone line or uh, in your connections, is <laughs> not as good as it should be. I was meeting with a client. A microphone on a, on a phone is not uh, brilliant. Exactly. Half the time. Meeting with a client yesterday, and she, uh, she's in New York, and you know, and she, she's trying to figure out how to record her with a local host here. And, and I suggested we could do a double ender. And she was like, "What? What's a double ender?" Right? And I explained it. And it was like I was talking you know, from Mars or something. She just couldn't wrap her head around that. But it was like we were trying to figure out technically how do we avoid that phone line sound that you get because the people that we record here in Pittsburgh are going to sound great. Right? They're going to sound like studio quality, and she's going to be on this tinny phone line, right? So, yeah, so that's we can deal with that through technology. But some people just accept it. I listen to podcasts, and maybe you have too, where just like every podcast episode, there seems to be like just a phone interview, right? And they're always really bad, and the levels are really wacky. And, but they put that out there. And, you know, I'm not, I want to say this, just a sort of disclaimer. I just want to point out the technical part of all this, right? I mean, I'm not, I don't like to pass judgment people's work but you know if you're a student of audio engineering and, this, and you're critical of, of you know this field and your own work then you, know, you have to sort of gauge this like what's going on here right it's good bad why you know that sort of thing so that's a kind of discussion that you know it's well worth having so essential topics right so choosing using and making right so choosing the appropriate uh, microphone for podcasting and then using that appropriately, properly, if you will. And then once you have that recording, what are the things that you could do specifically uh, up front um, with that soundtrack that could make it better? Right? And we'll just talk about some, some, uh, some few items here with uh, each, each one of these here. You know, I like to think, like the old uh, saying, you know, garbage in, garbage out sort of thing. It, it, it all begins with the podcast. Uh, session and that microphone that you're using and the space that you're in because you know what happens there is going to be in your editing room in the post-production world right so you're gonna to have to deal with that so you can't make a you can only make things sound better you can't necessarily make them sound good you know what I mean so if, if things are poorly recorded you have the wrong microphone or a microphone that doesn't fit the context you're using it in a crazy way uh, all that's going to just cascade down the down the workflow I work with uh, um, a veterans group and we do these live events and so microphones go out in the public you know this, uh, around a breakfast and um, people get microphones they've never had a microphone in their lives some of them you know and they'll have a microphone like this just like oh, this oh. and they'll talk like this <laughs> into the microphone you know yeah. or they're talking like this you know I mean obviously you know they're not my professionals right they don't know so I always tell the MC like dude you've got to like give some direction there and when I get a chance, I you know I just give the direction, like you know, hold it up, talk into it, point at your chin, hold it about a fist away, yada yada, right? But you know some people remember that, and some people don't. But literally, literally, I, in fact, I have a guy on video talking like this in the microphone. Well, that recording is going to be that recording, right? It is what it is. So it all starts with the microphone, as I mentioned, the right tool for the right job. 
So, um, what kind of mics do you guys use? And why do you use the mics that you do? And how do you use them? In other words, do you have certain microphones you use in certain contexts, environments for different people? Oh, wow. That is many. Holy moly. And that has microphones in it. Yeah. Go in. Does it work well for you? It works okay. But, um, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Your microphones? What you're using? Um, we have you know, like dynamic mics uh -huh. in our studio, um, primarily. Um, I have um, an AT44 in a blue bottle at home for other purposes. It's hard to go back and forth. <laughs> yeah, you have to let all this um, stuff around. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah. but but they, they both deliver, and as I'm sure we could get into, right? They, they both deliver very different sort of. You know, they're pro depending on the job, one's appropriate or not appropriate. Right. These 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 are tools. So you know you have a blue yeti, right? Yeah. So that's a that's a tool that you have, and that tool, like any other tool, has its place in certain contexts, right? Right. Maybe not around a big group of people, like you said, that maybe two people, and it sounds sweet, right? Perfect. And you get a larger space, and yada, yada. More distance between the, the people and the, and the mic gets a little unwieldy, right? Yeah, it, I mean, it picks up fine. Um, we've done it before, but there's definitely a, a difference in the audio and the sound when, there's, when you switch it, because it has the settings on it, so you can change it from setting where it picks up everything around and where just the two of us it just picks up like the two ends just pick up so it's hard, hard, right? yeah right. so there's definitely a I mean it sounded good for what it was but it is definitely a sound quality difference when you're using it bidirectional as compared to opening up the whole thing you're in the same space you're going to record you know you could have the best high-end microphone tool, uh, but if you're misusing it, right, it's going to sound like the lowest end tool possible, right? So here, um, so this is a uh, Sennheiser MK416, right? Industry standard, uh, boom micing, field production work, you know, a pretty high-end mic that, man, if it's way out here or if it's like this, you know, on somebody, it's going to sound like crap, right? Or you could have a, you know, a 58 or here's an 8. ATR 2100, right? Nice mic, not very expensive. All right, probably 10 of these for this. Uh, this could sound pretty good if you use it right. You know what I mean? And if you know more about it, which we'll get into it in a bit, like a DQ curve, for example, you can sort of post-process it so it sounds really good, really good, as good as you know anything else up here. Here's a Neumann TLM 102, right? Sweet high-end condenser microphone won't work for beans if you're in a noisy room right <laughs> it'll be just garbage you know this 58 199 dollars you know here's a 57 you know um here's a 7b uh, a little more expensive than these but these will work much better much better tool to use in a noisy environment as a uh, as opposed to using these condenser mics so yeah the right the right tool is so important, and I don't, you know, if you only have one microphone, I started off with a recorder, a Zoom H, Zoom H2, that's what I had, when I got into this business about seven, eight years ago, and I used it for a long time, that's the only thing I had, I used it for everything, and then it's, uh, it's like, well, I'm going to do something else, and I need a little bit different tool, right, so I started to build my toolkit, um, be because I was thinking about it, and that's one of the things I want to stress today is, you know, if, if, we who produce and create podcasts are constantly thinking about ways that we improve, ways that we diversify our toolkits. Um, boy, our craft will get better. Our craft will improve. And I think that's the goal of all of ours, right? We want to be better podcasters. It's a goal of mine. Um, so purpose, right, of, of mics. Why, why mics matter? Well, you know, in the podcast world, very different than music. And music production. Man, it's like a whole different world. These guys that make music, the microphones that they use, you know, they just don't often match up with the needs of podcasting, which
which is around boys, human boys, right? So I don't know. Do you guys have any experience of of um, having mic microphones or using microphones that are just not suited to the human voice, but would work fine for for uh, uh, you know podcasting? Oh, here's an example. As far as doing like well, the guy using a dynamic. Yeah. So this is like. It's for years, still is a, a stage standard for musical groups, right? The Shure SM58. Put it, put it on someone's voice, just speaking without music. It sounds like mud. Right? I don't know if you ever used one of these. They're really, I'm sure I have it. Somewhere. It's a dynamic for one, right? So it takes a lot of oomph to get it sound in there, but it's just, it's just heavy in the low end. You know what I mean? It's heavy. So it sounds great for a band screaming into it. You could scream in this thing. You could do anything. You can bang this thing. It won't bust. It won't bend. Awesome microphone. But man, when you get it foot on voice or spoken word, it just doesn't sound good. You know? The same thing. This was my very first microphone I ever bought. This is the 57. These are essentially the same microphones, just a different capsule or different um, uh, grilling around the capsule. Uh, yeah, when I got this, it was like, man, this sounds like crap. Then I learned how to use it, and I learned how to EQ it right, and then I'm pretty successful with it now. Um, oh, a little trivia, by the way. This microphone has been, not this particular one, but this has been on the presidential podium for the past 50 years. You see those microphones on the presidential thing, right? It used to be three, um, and then after the uh, Queen of England uh, was speaking, and she... Someone forgot to raise her up, and she was. Uh, you can you can look this up on you on YouTube. George Bush, uh, second George, first George Bush, was doing a thing with the Queen of England, and so they had the microphone, everything set up for him to speak. Three these three big microphones, and then she got three, up there. Three of those. And all you see is a hat. It's, this is like totally covers her face, oh. right? And so that, that's then they went to two. Then they had two for years and years and years. President Obama, you look at any President Obama, George W. Bush. He's using two of these microphones side by side, right? And now uh, President Trump, there's one microphone there. I don't know what that is. I, I, I assume it's a 57. But the SM57 has been used for presidential work forever. Yeah, I, I you know what? I, I've noticed that there is maybe one or two or three that I've never honestly thought about. Why? Yeah. Do, do you... Yeah, there's no reason why there's more than one other than Duplicate tracks. Was they recording one for this and one? one for yeah, they, ones for they had a, a backup track. One would go to the press pool. Yeah, I mean they do all that splitting out in different ways. But that, originally that was why they had three, and then they went to two. But it, there was no other. There's no sound reason why. Okay, um, I was going to say because I didn't make any thought about it. It'd be weird, you know, because uh, we'll talk about it a bit. You know, sound is additive. So the more microphones you have open at once, the more you're picking up all that hum from that fan and all the crowd. You know what I mean? So it's always best to have as few mics as possible. I just saw a funny picture of uh, the uh, guy, uh, the, the dictator in uh, North Korea, and he was he had this bank of microphones <laughs> like this, all lined up, and he's like talking, <laughs> and all his microphones are like pointing over here, pointing over there. I was like, what's that about? I mean, it's, it's just show, right? It might be for show. <laughs> it's totally for show, yeah. <laughs> oh, this, um, this, but this is the Shure SM7B. Th these two, these three Shures are essentially the same microphone. The capsules are exactly the same. A little bit different uh, guts to them beyond the capsules, but they are exactly the same capsule-wise. This is what Michael Jackson recorded Thriller on. The whole album was recorded on a 7B, his voice parts. Not this particular one, but... Uh, <laughs> if it was, I'd be telling you that. Yeah. <laughs> Environment, right? The next thing. Uh, I do most, all of my recording. I don't have a brick-and-mortar studio, so I'm on the road all the time recording stuff, all kinds of environments. I recorded in a coal mine. I recorded around kitchen tables. I recorded out on the street. I recorded, you name it, parades, all kinds of places, right? The environments are always changing for me. So I have to think about, well, okay, if it's going to be noisy, what do I bring what, out of my toolkit? And this is where a dynamic microphone is just killer because... This has great, these have great rejection. It takes a lot of room to get power into these things. Um, so it's going to pick up the sound source appropriately from an appropriate 
through the mud, it's going to pick it up beautifully and reject everything else. That lack of sensitivity with the dynamic mic is really to your advantage, right? And it means it's not going to be stuck real good in the mic. Fans. <laughs> yeah. Now, okay, that reminds me. So if we had a condenser mic here, condenser mic, right? So I said to Mike, hey, we've got the same microphone. These condensers, because they're electrified, uh, they are so sensitive. And man, I'll tell you, they will just crush any recording environment if it's not suited you know, to this. It will pick up everything. And not only in the environment, but it will pick up weird stuff from the speakers, like lip smacks. I mean, you know there's a thing called uh, uh, misophonia, misophonia, where when you hear someone chewing food, or lip smacking, it just like skews you out. It's a real thing, by the way, right? Yeah, these things pick that up in a big way. So beware. <laughs> now here's this microphone. So this is a shotgun microphone. So if I were recording in a noisy environment, and I wanted some really high fidelic audio, I would choose this condenser mic because it has great rejection because of its design. So these are, are not um, uh, heat vents. These are sound ports that uh, cancel out, help cancel out any sound coming in from the sides of this microphone, which gives you a nice, very directional cone, right, off, off the front end. So I can pick you up from here, right, and I will hear you beautifully if everything else would be rejected around it. Because this is a tiny, tiny. Some people think, in fact, in fact, I heard a guy one time say, this, this is how these work. When you, when you speak into them, your, your breaths of air go in and you know, those puffs and they get vented out to the sides, right? So it doesn't affect the, the capsule. What? what? What are you talking about? The guy knew nothing about how these things work, how they work at all. So, and that was his, you know, you two, right? When they start saying, like, like you're, somehow your peas would yeah you're not you're not impact your plosives would not be impacted they would yeah. be, be shunted out these vents off to the side right now I've heard people say these have great reach well they don't have great no microphones has any reach at all it's, they're all passive receptors what this does is just focus very sharp in the direction of the, the axis so theoretically like it has great reach but they're wonderful microphones for the right purpose. Um, ROI, right? That's a business term. You know what it means? Return on your investment, right? So, uh, I buy a $99 microphone, I buy a $1,000 microphone. I'm, I'm in a business of making money, right? Am I going to get any sort of return off my $1,000 investment versus my $100 investment? I mean, it's an open question, right? It's, it's what you have to think about it. Is it necessary, right? Is a Neumann microphone absolutely necessary to do a podcast? Man, I've only done three or four with this mic, uh, two of them, and I tell you what, they're stunning and sound quality. I said, man, I, I, I have an idea of what that costs to buy. Well, the 102s are the cheaper end, so it's okay. 700 or so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So 103s that are more expensive, and it's the, the U87s, which, which is are... the U87. Yeah. But I, they are I mean, they are still stunning microphones. But, man, am I making money off of this thing for what I put into it? I don't know. But I'll tell you what. I, I, I did some radio work recently, right? So I'm, I have uh, some production on KQV radio. Well, that's pretty high-value kind of production. You know what I mean? So I pulled out the Neumanns, and I did a guy doing some voiceover work. Like this, beautiful, right? In that case, it worked, right? So that's what I mean by ROI, right? You know, a lot of microphones, the quality is just so awesome today with microphones. Um, good bang for your buck, you know what I mean? That SM58, 57, that Blue, Blue Getty, awesome microphone, right? Yeah, good ROI, I think. And, you know, feel free to chime in on any of this. Um, 
So worst practices. We'll talk about the worst practices uh, before we talk about the best practices, right? So um, an untreated space. Now, like I said, I go to all kinds of places. Sometimes I show I've never been there before. I show up and it's like, oh, I'm going to do a recording here. What am I dealing with? You know what I mean? I don't have the wherewithal to put, bring in bogos, you know, the sound traps, and put up the, any you know, deflectors or reflectors, absorbers, anything like that. Uh, so, you know, but I do what I do what I can. I will move the microphones away from solid surfaces. I will bring uh, like a cloth, and I'll put that over. A, if I'm recording around a kitchen table, I'll put that over uh, that table so I don't get these reflective waves off the off the hard surface. Right, but if you think about okay, you, you you start in the space where you are. If you if you walk into a room like this and you're like, oh, I don't even think about whatever, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice because there's always something you could do, space-wise, whether it's moving yourself in that space or putting a blanket over the table that could help that room be better. Now you see um, echo and hums. There's a hum in here, right? Hear the echo? Can you hear an echo here? Well, that's not a problem unless we get loud, right? But don't get loud, right? That's the thing. Sometimes I deal with oh, people with hearing problems, you know, elderly people with hearing problems. Holy cow, they get loud. You know what I mean? And I have to get loud because you have to communicate if we're not wearing headphones, right? Most of those situations we're not. Mm -hmm. But man, they're loud and all these, these echoes, right? So when you have echoes in the room, you have something what's called phase, phase issue. So if you are... If you're, if you're speaking to me, the direct sound source is coming right to this microphone. Beautiful. But that sound is going to bounce everywhere. That sound is going to bounce off the walls. And so the sound coming from you to this microphone is going to be the shortest, dis shortest distance between two points in a straight line, right? But the sound that goes from your mouth bounces to that wall. And then over here, it's going to take a little bit longer. So that little bit, uh, the secondary wave that hits it of your same voice it's going to cause a phase issue. It's going to be just a little bit lag behind. The, the one that bounces off the ceiling and then the floor is going to be a little bit behind that. When you get those differentials, you get the echo. You get the phase issue, right? So move, removing yourself from hard surfaces, don't get too close to the walls when you record, or don't get too close to flat surfaces in particular. If you go to recording studios, mostly they're never straight line walls. They're always angled in some way glass is always bevels one way, upwards or downwards, is to keep these reflective waves from causing phase issues in the microphone. But, you know, we have control over that, and we can always do something, like I said, if we just, it's in our consciousness to, like, you know, what, what do I need to do here to make this a better recording space? So that's the first one there. Mic distance. No microphone in the world is going to pick up well like this. <laughs> None. That's just physics, right? And no microphone is going to pick up very well <laughs> if it's like this. Um, I, I know a guy who holds his microphone to his chin. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, Larry, why do you do that? He said, I'm taught to do that. Okay. <laughs> why do you do it? And he said, I don't know. I just, but you know what? I tell you what, it's never, he's on it, right? It just stays glued to his chin as he talks. Um, but if we're too far away, what else are we picking up? We're picking up my voice, sort of. We're picking up that sound, all the other sounds in the room are coming in, into this space as well. But if we're like this, we can often get something that's called proximity effect, right? The closer you are to your microphone, the bass is accentuated and you get that jubrudio voice, right? That's, that's partly because of proximity uh, effect. The closer we get, the, all the bass notes get accentuated. So we don't want to get too close, but don't get too far away. So as you're podcasting, I, and I have to always have to remind myself, too, to set myself up on the microphones. If you're watching someone else, too, you have to make sure that they are appropriately distanced from the microphone. Usually, depending on the mic, but usually about a fist away, uh, pointing at the chin. That's a good distance, as a general rule, right? This reminds me of uh, something called close micing, right? So close micing is basically what it, what it says. Uh, it's getting your microphone close so you're really, really in that sound space. 
it's important for podcasting in my experience because podcasts are intimate, right? They're very personal. They're not like radio voice where it's jamming at you and it's, it's you're listening to, often you're listening to headphones, earbuds, right? A quieter space perhaps. It's intimate. So having your microphone, like you think of the NPR sound, you know, the, the radio, the cool radio, smoky voice, you know, it's just there. It's so present. Supposed to be way out here, you know, and it sounds echoey and distant. Handling noise. Oh my gosh, is this a big one? So these people that I deal with at these live events, they are fooling around, they're flipping microphones around, they're just what are they doing? They're scratching themselves with it, you know what I mean? Man, all that comes in into you know, and the only you know the, the weak link in that scenario is that they're holding the microphone. Right? Mm -hmm. If I have the microphone on a stand, problem solved. Right? I mean, barring that they're not standing out here on it like this, but handling noise can very easily, easily be done away with just by putting that microphone on a stand of some sort, just like this right here. I saw some podcast recording not too long ago here in Pittsburgh, and people were were. One was on one mic was on a stand, but the other guest had handheld. You know, mm. uh, could have been better. Could have been better if they were all on stands, right? But so in the earlier session, the presenter mentioned that another podcaster, another interviewer, had recommended always has their the person interviewing hold the mic, so it would be like a correct distance. But the trouble is, is that you run into so many other problems that they're mishandling it, they're bumping it, they're, they're changing the distance. Yeah. I, I, do, I don't, that, that really, I mean, having it on a stand where it's in one place and, you, yeah. and, and it's not being moved around. Yeah. It, it, and the other, along the other line too, is people pounding the table. Absolutely. Or hitting the table or tapping the table. Uh, absolutely. And that, that brings me to my next my next point, uh, if you are going to put your microphone on a stand, it's also a good idea to, to use a shock mount, right? So here's here's a shock mount for this CAD uh, GXL 3000, right? That sounds like a Jetson scooter. Um, so here's a shock mount, right? It's suspended with these elastic cords. So even if you have this on your mic stand, right? And this happens all the time in my work, someone bangs thumps it, right, or their hand goes like this, you know, that will really help mitigate that thump on that, right? So, so in my book, it's not enough just to have your mic on a stand, but have it shock mounted as well. Very, very important. And the thumping of the table, which is a problem for people who put their microphones on your Blue Yeti, right? It's on a table, Yeah. right there. If you bang that table, can you hear it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. People can't help themselves, I tell you. That's, yeah, that's true. Um, air conditioner buffers. So a buddy of mine gave me when we stacked them up and put them up after that. Yeah. So yeah. Some of that. Yeah. Shock mount. Yeah. 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 A shock mount, right? A sort. Yeah. 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 People put uh, towels down and do all kinds of things uh, to shock mount. If you have that, that's your setup, that's your setup, right? And, and yeah. you, can, you can do something about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, going back to, you know, we were talking about at the beginning of this, if it matters to get the best darn recording you can, well, those thumps and bumps and stuff go against that, right? So let's work that out. Mic levels, that's another thing here, right? You mentioned things are too loud, too quiet. Um, dynamic range is all over the place, right? So there's a happy medium in there, isn't there? Right? Your mic level. I mean, I, I, honestly, I don't think so. Like, if you were telling me, well, how many dB should this be? Well, there's sort of guides on how loud it should be recorded, right? But we know too soft when too, it's too soft. We know too loud when it's too loud, for sure. And we're going to talk about that um, in something that's called loudness normalization here in just a bit. So, yeah, so having something that's not too hot or, or too low is very important. And, of course, the bad mix is the next thing I want to talk about. Um, so often when people have multiple microphones, they have 
a recorder that they can bring those microphones into um, and record a mix, right? Both mics together and a mix. So if you're on a microphone and I'm on a microphone, right, and I and I'm holding mine, right, and this yours is on the stand, and I'm doing all this rustling or I bang it or something, if that is mixed down together, it's cooked in, it's baked in. I can't get that out. If I sneeze over here, right, that's neat. And if you're talking while I, I sneeze, that's it, right? I may be able, might be able to understand it. I might not, right? So having a, having a sound soup, a mix, is, in my book, um, it's one way to do it. And there are great mixes. You can make a great mix. But it's not as advantageous as, as doing multi-track recording. So here's a little uh, recorder. This is a, a three input recorder, right? So your track comes in here, my track comes in here, your track would come in here. So if you sneeze, I just squelch that out, right? So the other tracks are clean, right? So it's a, it's a great way to go around that, that mix down uh, problem that we have. Do you, have any, you guys, do you mix stuff down or do you multi-track record? Multi-track. Yeah. Anyone else? It's one feed. Because you have the one mic. Yeah, right. One track. Yeah, one track is one track. But yeah. yeah. If you have more than one track, then that's that then it's the issue, right? So here to, in my book, the absolute worst practice is if you don't care about sound quality. <laughs> right? And honestly, some you know, I ask the question, why why does this stuff exist? I think in part I don't know to what degree this is this really is the case, but I think a lot of people just do not care about the sound. Let me tell you, there there are people who are doing they're doing podcasts and they make videos of those podcasts. So I see it all the time. Oh, it's a video of a podcast. I click on it and I'm watching it. They're on the microphones, but I'm listening to what? What am I listening to? Like they've got great microphones, right? You know, this thing, right? It's like well, how come I'm not hearing that microphone? What's going on there? Do they not care that that video version of their podcast should not have good sound, right? Good quality sound? I don't know. I try not to judge. I'm saying what it is, right? But that's a choice that someone makes. Whoever engineered that decided, well, we're not going to put that good quality track sound on there. Uh, we're just going to put whatever. The, 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 the audio that comes through the camcorder for example that's a big thing so it's just my little thing here you know people don't care about the sound in a lot of cases so best practices make a quiet space like this is what we talked about earlier right you can absorb the sound you can diffuse the sound you can wait till it is quieter i do a lot of recordings on sundays in places it's called, sundays are often quiet not always sometimes i recorded one time on a sunday had it all planned out went down to collinsville Hey, it's Sunday, it's going to be quiet. Man, I'm right next to a church on Sunday. All the traffic is going to the church. Well, that didn't work out for me. Trains, that's another thing, right? You know, dealing with trains. And I don't know train schedules, but yeah. Bringing it close, right? Finding the right distance. We talk about that with this microphone. you got to just think about where is the best place to put that microphone. You know what I mean? And it's different. Some, you might have a person with a loud voice. You know what? The rule of the fifth way ain't going to work, right? You're going to back that baby off a little bit, right? Because your levels are going to blow out. Or you might have a you got to move that thing a little closer. But if you're too close, you're going to get the plosives, and you're going to get the proximity effect, and it's going to be all muddy, right? So it's always a sort of like, what's going on here? What's the best placement for this person, this context, this room, right? This environment, right? So again, you're thinking about uh, the sound quality. Uh, protecting the mic, right? So here we have a, you know what this is called? Yeah, this foam piece. Yeah, it's it's a windscreen. That's not a pop filter. That's a windscreen. That works great in the wind. These don't work so great as pop filters. In other words, the plosives, right? Because they're, they're not like a wind, which is a more gentle um, kind of effect. Uh, but, it, you know, you've seen the pop filters that are, the flat discs, right? They're nylon or they're metal mesh or something. Those are designed really to, to mitigate the plosives 
that might you know hit the uh, diaphragm. These not so much, but they work. They, they'll work great, really, you know. Um, but there is a technical difference between the two. So protecting using a pop filter and a windscreen that would protect um, your microphone from those uh, those um, distractions. Do you, do you have any recommendations in terms of pop filters? In terms of uh, some mics come with them. You can get, yeah. You can make your own. You can. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on did, that? Did your Blue Yeti come with one? It didn't come with one, but like the way I bought it, it was a package deal. You know, it came with a, a pop filter, uh, headphones, and Yeti is $160. Yeah, I'll answer your question like this. Uh, years ago, I said to my dentist, hey, there's this new electric toothbrush that came out. I said, what do you think of this toothbrush? He said, it'll work if you use them, right? <laughs> so, okay. Well, pop filters are the same way, right? I, I, I got embroidery hoops, and I put nylons yes. over them, yeah. and I made, I made my own. They work great, right? And I have $40 pop filters uh, that I've sat on and busted. You know what I mean? Uh, they all work great if you use them, right? So The important thing is to have them. It's to have them, yeah, because there are times when you do need them, especially with the use, again, knowing what your mic is, knowing what your tool is, these condensers really should always have a pop filter on them, really. I mean, just to be safe, you know. Or if you know how to use them, you can take them off axis of your voice, right? And that's probably the best thing you can do just from the get-go is, you know, don't have this microphone right here where it's right in the plosive field. Just have it off, off side so the wind goes this way, right? Simple, simple trick that, man, you hear people not abiding by that, and you hear the effects of it all the time. It's, it's, I, I don't know. Personally, I find that hard to listen to. Hard to listen to. Yeah. And so go back to the, you know, back to the beginning of this. If something is distracting and it's, it has all this stuff in it, it's hard to listen to. Something that's hard to listen to is not pleasant to listen to something that's not pleasant we're humans we avoid unpleasantry right so i don't listen to that crap honestly i don't right Gra <laughs> you know grandma you, you you might listen to grandma's podcast because it's grandma but if it's somebody i don't know and it sounds full of plosives and stuff you know, i'm not listening to it i'm just not right that's a good point though multi-track recording we talked about there you know if you multi-track record you can let each microphone, as I call it here, shine. I think it's an isolation. You just hear that voice. I'm going to show you something in just a bit, something called ducking, that makes a huge difference in making each mic, each voice, just shine in these recordings. And use your ears, right? This is a super important thing. I say to the guys I work with, I train a lot of guys. I hire independent contractors and stuff. Uh, and all the time I'm like, dude, just listen to this. Does this sound good to you? I can say that a million times. Does this sound good to you? Yeah. Okay, let's figure out why that sounds good to you. I don't know why. Uh, you know, it, it could be, and this is actually a real thing that I've been dealing with, is how people are listening to the audio. Now, uh, this one guy works for me. He's, he was actually, he had one, um, he had noise canceling headphones. Well, noise canceling headphones are great for canceling noise, but they're not good for engineering at all. They're bass biased, right? They're really meant for a different kind of listening experience. Uh, another guy was listening listen to the audio work on um, Beats, you know, those Beats headphones, right? Designed for music, right? The EQ curves are different uh, than for engineering purposes. So that's why I put monitor here. The monitor speakers and monitor headphones are I don't know why this is so expensive. Why are they so expensive? But they are. Monitor speakers and headphones give you a very, very flat response. So we hear on a spectrum from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, right? 20 kilohertz. Those monitor setups, they reproduce sound as fidelic as possible. There's no bias, really, um, to speak of. In other words, the bass isn't pumped up because, you know, it's for the musicality of it, right? There's not a lot of a high end in there, right, to make it shine and sparkle. It gives you a flat response. So as an engineer, you hear what the heck you're hearing, right? So if you recorded something with, um, 
with I mentioned this microphone uh, in these SMs, they're they're bass heavy, right? Well, I want to hear that bass because I want to cut it out. And when I cut it out, I want to hear if I cut out enough of it, right? I can't tell, I can't make an, an accurate judgment if I'm listening to something that is biased, right? So the monitor speakers and headphones are worth their weight in gold if you're doing any sort of serious um, uh, engineering at all or editing. Now, I use, um, I didn't bring any with me. I use a, uh, I use Sony um, 7506s, pretty industry standard, uh, really nice flat response things. And I have a, I have a set of desktops that are um, Yamaha's um, H5s. Really nice. Really nice. I'm here. I'm really here with the crappy job I did recording. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're um, recording in the field, will you record to the I do. Uh, the guy had a, I gave a guy a kit, and, uh, and I just opened it up this morning. He gave it back to me, and he took my, you know, it's a nice pair of headphones, a nice little cable he took that cable and just wrapped it around the headphones your Sony, your Sony headphones. yeah and it's, it's all three pairs I gave him stuck them in the bag I pulled it out and it looked like uh, I'm so mad um, but, I, but I personally I take the risk of, of bringing those high-end my headphones out there to the field because I really want to hear but I often have these little Sony's uh, in a, as a, a backup set you know and you hear just fine and you know what you can't hear much fidelity uh, in the field anyways. You really can. It's when you're in a studio or you know, you're, you're editing. That's when you really want that. But, you know, it doesn't hurt to be uh, to have the best you know, kind of gear you can have. But not necessary in my book, you know. Do you have a recommendation for either a hobbyist or a serious hobbyist that for headphones that are like maybe less than 50 or less than $100? Uh, those, those little Sonys, I think I even bought them at Walmart. Uh, 25 bucks, I think they are. Really nice. Um, what was the model number again? You know, I, I, in fact, I wrote this down. I built an inventory. That it's like some long number. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it is. But they're, they make uh, white ones and black ones. They're Sony's. They're like the big. I wish I would have brought them. But you know what? I don't. I don't have. But, but you know what? This I do this all the time. I research stuff, and I find you got to sift out the you know the advertising and the marketing. And there are many places that give them some straight up scoops on you know pros and cons and stuff. You'll find in that price range, you'll find some decent stuff. And I really recommend to buy as best as you can, right? And if you you know you work with ROI, right? We talked about that. You know, live within your means, of course. You know, I use those little Walmart things for years and years, right? That's all I had, and they work great for me. Yeah, but but, but understand what you're listening to. That's 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 really key. Well, and I did that, that research myself, and when you're reading reviews, you have to pay attention to the ones that are obviously done by people that are using them for the same purpose you are. And they're not listening to just music, right? Yeah. They're, they're listening, to, they're trying to record and do exactly what you're yeah. describing. And I have that same pair of Sony, and if you see photos of like, uh, you see them everywhere. Now, they're, I, I, they're, I think they're about 100 bucks. Yeah. Sure. And and I can tell you, if you take good care of them and don't wrap up the, <laughs> they will last a long time. Oh, yeah. In fact, the pair I got, the, the the headphones are still good. I had to replace the pads because the pads started running out. But you can get replacement pads. But the headphones are still good. And and it's it's um, a worth. I think it's a worthwhile investment. Now my first pair, and I, I can never pronounce it right, Sennheiser. Sennheiser. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I paid. Probably about fifty or sixty, and they're not they're not bad. But again, I did my research and made sure it was ones that were suitable for this it's, for this work. It's key word right here. That's why I tell us you're looking for monitor headphones or monitor desktop speakers. Monitor. That's the word that you want to search for. Okay. Yeah. Um, how are you supposed to still record? Uh, <laughs> I kind of loop it loosely. Okay. Put so them together. Don't, you don't have the tension. This guy like pulled it taut and wrapped it around like a like a Bronco jockey or something. I was crazy. I couldn't believe he did that. Yeah, I just uh, you know just like with audio cabling, whatever you always want to keep the lay of the cord mm -hmm. because if you start jacking around with that, you know you're stressing the, the conductor inside. And 
I'm going to want to fool with that. Okay. So for my absolute best practice is trust your ears, right? Trust your ears. Understand that there's a real thing called ear fatigue, right? So if you do like I do and you just, you're, you're very goal oriented and you just, oh, I got to get this done. Or, you know, you'll spend five hours straight editing and then your ears are bleeding, right? Uh, so you got to understand that part of it too, but trust your ears. Listen to something. You know what I mean? Does this sound good? Does this sound how I want it to sound? You know what I mean? And if your gut, uh, uh, you know, when you do this enough, uh, long enough, you get a gut about this. And you go, ah, I, I can't tell you how many projects I've gotten three quarters of the way through and like, oh, I went off the rails here. I don't understand, you know, and I've four applications of EQ and stuff. And it's like, I don't even know how to undo this, you know, start it again. You know what I mean? I nail it. Eventually I will nail it. And that's always my thing. I, I say to myself, that's it. I trust my ears on this. And it works for me. So trust your ears. Post-production essentials. Um, these are the five things that I think are just critical to production work. And this is really, you know, a step removed from your, your microphone. But it really goes back to um, your track. Equalization, compression, noise reduction, ducking, and loudness normalization. If you've never heard of these terms, um, there's just a lot of stuff on YouTube around this stuff. I would, I, I'm not going to cover much today on this stuff, because it could be pretty complicated. Uh, but I just want to point out, like, for equalization, right? You know, equalization really means the balance of frequencies, right? So if you're, who said that we were beginning, so that it has to sound balanced, or normal, natural. Yeah, so if your sound, that voice sounds natural and balanced, hey, there you go, EQ's on, right? If it doesn't, it might be because your microphone, this bassy heavy, mud heavy uh, SM7B is influencing that, right? So uh, understanding the EQ, EQ curve of your microphone is a good way to sort of like get your head around, like why does this sound like it does? Here's a, this is the EQ curve for this microphone, 50, the 58. You see that it actually rolls off here in this low, low frequency end, and, and up around here, around 2K, 3K, 4K, it's got a boost above the zero dB line. It's got a bit of a presence boost there, right? But this is what I mean by flat. That is a flat frequency response between uh, 200, 125, and uh, 900. Very flat. Um, so if you're listening to your microphone, if you're listening to your track recording on a microphone, and it's got a bit of a high presence to it, like you know, you're getting these like high sibilances, right? The the S's. Well, it might be because this microphone has a built-in boost in that range. So you might want to compensate, cut that out. And all microphones have an EQ curve to them, and you can find it on the manufacturers. A page. Um, so this is uh, just to go back. If, if you've never seen the frequency spectrum, this is what I'm talking about. Down here is the bassy range. Here, this is the mud range between about two, uh, 100 and 400 hertz, and this is the high seven the sparkle, the clarity range up there. So 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. This is what you're looking at. Right here. I do a lot of right here. Most everything that I record, I, I record stuff flat, like I, I'm a photographer as well, I record everything raw, I shoot raw, I, you know, it looks like crap when I get it back and put it in my, in my editor, um, but I need, to, I need to adjust it, right? So all the data is there. All the data is there. So I record the same way. I bring in all the data. I don't do any roll loss in the field. Um, so my stuff usually has a really heavy bass thing. If I cut this zone out of here a couple of dB, whoa, it sounds nice and clear, right? It's starting to really nice, you know, intelligibility is bumping up. Oh, let's get back here. Uh, so I mentioned here, the low end of stuff is around 60 hertz. So these lights, that fan, these motors, that's all around the 60 hertz range. You can cut that off and get some of that crap out of there. And on the higher end, um, you know, that you can cut that off too because we don't hear very much. And the older we get, we don't hear that high end at all. My dad is 86. He, he 
He can't hear anything above 5K. Amazing. He can't hear that stuff at all. I'm getting there, too. <laughs> Compression, right? So here's a, here's a good example. This top track here, big dynamic range, right? You see the high peaks in the, in the, in the valleys. Right? That is an uncompressed track. This compressed track, the same one, but the compressor was run on it. Um, you can see how things are, the highs are brought down and the lows are brought up, right? That's a great way to bring up the presence in your mixes and then bring down some of those. You see the red lines here on the top? Those are actually clipping, right? So when I ran the compressor on this, that clipping actually went away. So I solved that problem by running a compressor on that. So compression is a very important thing to use on your tracks. Um, noise reduction, right? Very simple effect to apply. Um, it gets out these. So if you if you're quiet, you'll hear a steady hum. You'll hear kind of a high frequency hiss a little bit. Well, that noise reduction reduction effects can get that out of there in a very big way, but to a limited degree, right? You go too far, then you start to degrade your actual content. Ducking. This is this is to me one of the most important things. If you're ever using more than one track, if you're, if you're recording two two tracks, right? There's Bob and Tom. Okay, as Bob's Bob's talking, the cross bleed mic pickup is right here. Well, all sound is out of here, so you're going to hear some of the phase issues in there. It's going to be overly loud, right? So all through this, we've got this cross mic pickup. So, but if you duck it. And duck it means you just take out where one person's speaking, the opposite track, you silence it out, right? So if you just look to see how that how I ducked it, it makes all the difference in the world. And as I mentioned earlier, your individual track will just shine. This voice part will just be like, whoa. It will just pop right out of it because I ducked this, this audio down, ducked that section, ducked that section. There are automatic duckers. Uh, I never found them to work very well. I do it all manually myself. It's crazy, but you know, I'm I'm not recording in studios. I'm recording in coal mines and places like that. Uh, so, th but this is how you make up for it. So, an, uh, an automatic ducker would go and try to find the spots and adjust them accordingly, right? and, and they never work. No, no work. They'll cut into parts, and yeah, they'll cut out, clip things, uh, you know, content out. Yeah, it's crazy. But I, I take it once you said you do it yourself. Once you've done a lot of that. I assume you've learned to recognize right where you need. Oh, yeah, yeah. After yeah. experience, you, visually, you can see where it needs to happen. Yeah, I'm a two-handed editor. I, I move, and I, I can almost do stuff visually. But I always, you know, I do, I'll, I'll do it, and I'll go back, and I'll verify that sure. I did it right. And Yeah, but you get fast at it after a while. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is loudness normalization. This is so important. This is setting your audio level for the human ear. There's such a thing as called the Fletcher, Fletcher Munson principle. Um, these are two audio engineers back in the 30s that discovered that we hear certain frequencies a certain way. When audio is low, we happen to hear the mid range of things. When audio is very loud, we happen to hear the bass and the treble side of things. The mid, we don't hear so well, right? So there are these uh, algorithms on certain effects that will take the frequency spread of your podcast the time of your podcast and sort of make a prediction. If this were a human ear listening to this, this is how loud it would be perceived. And that's the key thing, perceived loudness. So loudness normalization is all about coming up with perceived loudness, right? The standard um, here that once you get that standard down, you can apply that to all of your episodes. So when you click on episode one, episode two, three, four, they all have, you're not like raising the volume up or lowering it down from episode to episode. Another good reason to have that. This is sort of the standard right here. If you have a stereo track like I just showed you, it's about negative 16 dB. And this means loudest unit full scale. Um, it's also called LKFS for um, loudness. Uh, I think an audio engineer called it CAP, Bob Katz. That was the scale that he came up with. If you have a mono track, it's a little bit different uh, figure. It's negative 19 dB. So I have a picture of. Here's, here's a uh, track. Look at the compression on that baby. Oh, it's a lot of compression on that. Okay? So I ran it with this meter on it, and it said that came out to be 16 LKFS. And 
That's the standard. That's a, if you listen to podcast uh, podcasting, right? You'll hear this a lot. That's the standard for stereo tracks for loud implementation. They have 16. So on the money for that one. But a lot of a lot of programs, DAWs, digital audio workstations, they have built in loudness normalization effects. I use a standalone called Orbin or by the company Orbin. That's what that is there. Uh, okay, so the takeaways. This is what I showed you at the very beginning. It's all about choosing, using, and making uh, stuff here, right? So choosing that appropriate tool, right? It's a tool that has a time and place for everything. Uh, using it properly, not too close, not too far, uh, and making that microphone sound the best you can. I think just those principles that I brought up. Back to here. And it ju just just these here, if you attend to equalization, compression, noise reduction, ducking, and loud normalization, man, your stuff is going to shine. Just really shine. And I'm not going to kid you. I mean, this is all Greek to me. You know, I, I, I use Audacity because I don't want to learn anything else. <laughs> I've been using it for years. And when I first uploaded it or downloaded it, I'm going to say, I looked at it and said, oh, this is too, I, I took it off my computer. This is way too complicated. You know what I mean? And now I know it backwards and forwards. So this is all Greek to you, but I'm saying, uh, just get into it. You can kind of learn this stuff. Uh, lots of YouTube stuff out there to, to walk you through it. And man, I'll tell you, it'll it'll pay off in the end. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much, guys. Any questions? Uh, no, we didn't cover the differences between the two, and there are big time differences. And I'll tell you the main one. This is about microphones. Um, digital when in the digital world, when you go above zero dB, in other words, when you clip. That's a bad scene because it clips. I mean, it just chops the head off of the, that waveform. Unlike analog, right? There's a more forgiveness at the top end of things. And you can often get, you might be able to get a repair on some of that stuff. If you clip digitally hard, it's done. You screwed it up. You know what I mean? So in, in the digital world, that's the, probably the most pressing thing for me. Some people, uh, they think uh, analog stuff sounds better. In digital, like the old the, the debate around the CDs, you know what I mean, the, the versus the old vinyl, vinyl CD. I don't know. I don't know if I can hear it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But everything I do is all digital. Um, it's all going digital now. I don't think they're recording on tape at all anymore, are they? Analog? Are they recording analog anywhere? Audio? No. A quick question. I, I don't know if anybody else. Your thoughts on. Um, a USB mic, I don't know if that's what you use, yeah, right versus, here. you know, putting it right into the computer versus using the preamp, or do you have any thoughts on that? Good question, good question. Uh, I know it, uh, I know it. I mean, a lot of people say that, you know, sound cards really aren't up to snuff. Most sound cards, they're not. Um, so recording, and, and you've got a lot of stuff going on in your computer, right? The CPU is grinding away, a lot of stuff, you know. You might get these artifacts, I get it all the time on my computer, like little glitches. Pops and clicks and stuff like that, and then they drop outs. Uh, part of that whole apparatus on the inside. I always record the external recorder, um, 48K and 24 bit, because it's that high, high definition. Uh, and it always works out. The recording directly to the computer, people do it and people have great success. I'm not going to argue with it. I mean, it's, you know, if, if it works for you, it works for you, right? And it's wonderfully simple, you know, to do. Just plug a USB mic. This is the ATR 2100. You plug that baby in there, you know, pull up your DAW, record. Yeah, it works great. But I, just, I don't do it. Like I don't, I know when I do video work, I, I never record on camera either. I'm always off camera recording the audio. Um, so you aren't, you aren't plugging your mic into your preamp. You have a recorder that you use, a field recorder. Yeah, yeah. Here's one of my. This is uh, Sound Design Mix Three. This is something I, I never, yeah. I'm always recording into an external recorder, yeah, separately, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Thank you guys. I think I have to get out of here. <laughs> oh, by the way, I, this this is my website here. I, I think I have a bookmark here. Um, I've got a. I'm gonna give myself just a little bit of plug. There is. A, I have a podcast network, as the, does the Sorg family of podcasts. Uh, these are some, some of the podcasts that I have, um, I'm have. i producing right now. Oh, this one I'm not. I'm just promoting that one. But, uh, it's all good stuff. Okay. All right. Thanks. <laughs>